Well, good morning. Good to see you this morning. We're going to turn the lights back on so I don't look like Barney. You know, it's amazing how we go from not knowing anything to everybody being in our way. Do you remember when you were learning to drive and you were careful? And you, you didn't even know how to let the wheel go, so you like let it, you know, I don't know if you ride it that way. And you were careful, and now you're holding a coffee in your left hand, and you're driving, and people are in the way, and you're just like, you know, I'm going to push them through the lane. Maybe you don't do that. So I drove in Orlando yesterday. Those people do not know how to drive. <laughs> they need help. And, and, and how many of you have driven in Orlando lately? You've driven in Orlando lately? I see those hands. So when you drive in Orlando, you need Jesus. And um, I was driving in Orlando, and I was thinking, Jesus, take the wheel. And slam into that guy. That guy. I don't think Jesus would take the wheel that way, but I just, I thought. But it is funny how we do. So today we're going to talk about making better boundaries. Um, she's going to kill me. And just the fact that I said she's going to kill me, she's probably already upset. But um, Jan Dillingham is here today. She was my uh, secretary for like a billion years, actually like 18, 19 years. And has been in several churches with me. And this is the first time she's been in the building. And so I'm not going to make her stand up or anything. We're just going to clap for her. So, you know, we're going to finish it. love that. Most of us are glad you're here today. Um, <laughs> all right. So today we're going to talk about making better boundaries. Let me check my hand. Um, oh, celebration tickets. Um, we're celebrating not just the boundary series, but really this year. And I think we have a lot to celebrate. If you didn't get to buy tickets, um, if you would buy them before you leave, it's the last week really to get tickets. It'll be our first banquet ever. We're going to have it right in this room. And we'll have videos about the year and what God's done and the transition and all that he's done in between. And so it's really going to be an awesome time. You won't want to miss it. If you're struggling financially and have a hard time going, let me know. Um, and we'll see what we can do to help you out and uh, help you to pay 10 bucks for Olive Garden. You can't beat it. It's actually, we're actually giving you, you a discount from what they're charging us because we really want you to come to the banquet. So if you get a chance to do that, you can even sneak out during church and tell Peggy you want a ticket. All right. So some of you are like, that's a great idea. I wouldn't sermon. There's a couple of husbands now going to their wives. I think it's a good idea. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about this idea of making better boundaries. We've been doing, going through this series called Boundaries. There are boundaries all in the Bible. And here's the idea of boundaries, okay? We all need to learn boundaries and we need to learn better boundaries. But God has given you basically the ability to say yes to people and the ability to say no to people. And that's what we call a boundary, and it's really for your own good. When you learn to have good boundaries, it really helps you to enjoy life more because you begin to be motivated by different things. You can be motivated by love instead of by guilt, instead of condemnation, instead of sorrow. You can actually be motivated by love where you're, where you're actually doing things because you want uh, to love people, and you love God, so you want to love people. Um, it'll help you to be a better parent. Um, parents, you're going to love this sermon today. Uh, it'll help you to be a better boss, a better employee, a better student, and my favorite, personal favorite, a better church member. Um, I've been in a lot of churches where people just don't have good boundaries. They think everything's everybody else's fault. So no matter how good you are at boundaries today, I'm hoping that you'll just hear some little things to help you know if you're improving or if you have good boundaries. And if you've missed any of this series, it's online. There's a great book called Boundaries, which basically takes some biblical principles and helps you to understand where they are in the Bible. So we're going to talk today, the first part of the message is the message, and the second part is extra credit. And so the second part, don't get worried when we get to like point four and you're like, uh, it's almost time, and he's still going to have to go. And so don't worry, I will make sure that you beat the Methodist to cheers <laughs> up the road to eat. <laughs> cheers, is that the place up the road? Is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah. Eco Brady's? I don't know what you're going about. Arthur Treacher's? I don't know. Aren't there creatures even around? I just sing. I say random 80s things now and then. Every once in a while, I'll sing a Neil Diamond song just out of nowhere. I made it through the rain. That's where I started this morning. Would you say go to Vegas? Yeah. Squirrels. All right. So I want to tell you a true story first. 
So there were a couple of guys at a book signing event with Tom Hanks not that long ago, and um, a guy named Dave and a guy named Carl. And um, so, so Dave went to Carl and he said, hey, Les, when we go up to get our book signed, let's invite Tom Hanks over to the house. And he's like, whatever you want, Carl thought. That's, that's just crazy. So Dave went and he invited Tom Hanks over to the house. Tom Hanks said yes. So Tom Hanks comes to the house. Dave and Carl are there. Now, Carl is sitting in the living room, and, and uh, uh, some of the friends came over. A few folks came by the house. You know, they invited a few friends over. So Tom Hanks is telling jokes, and he's telling stories. And Carl's enjoying it. Dave is in the kitchen freaking out because um, he doesn't have enough nacho dip, you know. And, and not only that, he starts to get ticked that Carl isn't in the kitchen helping him, and he starts to get actually mad at Carl. So at one point, finally, uh, uh, Dave is so upset at Carl he actually goes into the living room. He interrupts Tom Hanks, okay? Doesn't talk to Carl, but Dave looks at Tom Hanks and says, Hey, Tom, can you make Carl help me in the kitchen? Interrupts everything. Now, the problem with having bad boundaries is that if you don't have good boundaries, not only will it impact the person that you're dealing with, and not only will it impact your enjoyment of life, You'll actually hurt other people because you don't have good boundaries. You don't even know who you're supposed to talk to when things don't go well. Now, the truth about that story is it's not really about Tom Hanks. It's really about Jesus. And it's really about two ladies named Mary and Martha. And it's really in Luke chapter 10, 38. And it didn't just happen a few weeks ago. But the story is absolutely true. And it's exactly how we respond. We look and we say, oh, I would never be like that. Get out of my way. You know, I, you know whatever. How dare you have coupons in public? You know, whatever. So I want to I go through this list and show you a few things that will help you as you're creating boundaries and maybe help you, especially as a parent, um, help you especially as you're dealing at work. Maybe you have a boss that's a little overbearing and, and how to deal with that, okay? So number one, do I notice, notice my Resentment. Now, resentment is a dashboard light in life. So if you're helping somebody or doing something for somebody, but you find that you're aggravated about it, that's resentment. If, if you're doing the right thing, but you are irritated and aggravated about it, Paul addresses this in 2 Corinthians. He's talking about finances, but it actually applies to much more than money. So I'm going to kind of talk about both sides of that real quick. Here we go. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give. Time out. So, first century church, they're already asking for money. Just want to point that out. Just saying it's nothing new. People are like, that church asked for money. I know. From churches. By the way, we don't talk about money a whole lot. I want you to know a couple things. Number one, I have no idea what anyone gives. So if you're sitting here going, he's getting ready to talk about money. I'm not. Uh, uh, but number two, the thing is, it's, it's got to follow these, follow these guidelines. Here it is. And this doesn't just apply to money. This applies to when you help somebody. This applies when you go out of your way to say, okay, I'm willing to do that. And when somebody asks you a question, you say, you know, you want to help me move? <laughs> Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give. It means it's planned. And then it says, not reluctantly. In the Greek, this word reluctantly means sorrowful. Not to give out of sorrow. So, so let me give you an example of that one. You're up at 3 o'clock in the morning because you have nothing better to do, and your body decided it didn't want to sleep. So you flick on the TV, and you're watching Gilligan's Island because you're trying to fall asleep. And all of a sudden, the commercial with all the animals. And you're like, so sad. send us money, or we're putting this dog to death. You know, whatever they do, right? Now, that is not, I think it says PCA, or he may, anyway, that is not a bad cause. That is a wonderful cause. But don't give just because you're sorry for an animal, or you're sorry for a person. Because if you do, you're just being manipulated to give. Paul's saying, don't give just because you feel sad. 
okay? So he doesn't stop there with don't give just because you feel sad. Don't give just because somebody made you, somebody's pictures made you cry. Don't give just because of that. And then he says, or under compulsion. The idea of compulsion is somebody's forcing you. You know, like, you know you really should. You know, so pastor just stands up and says, now listen, let me tell you something. I don't know why they do it with the country accent. They do. If we don't, and, and by the way, by the way, there's churches that pass the offering plate more than one time. Did you know that? My favorite was when I was building a building with a church years ago, we had a contractor come and say, we will build a gym for you that has a thumb pad, and if the people aren't tithing, it will lock them out of the gym. Okay. That sounds perfect, man. I was like, really? Gosh, it's too bad we're not going to use you to be our contractor. Under compulsion, it's the idea of being manipulated. It's the idea that somebody guilts you into helping them, and you're giving because you feel guilty. That's not a good motivation to give. But then it continues. For God loves an angry, frustrated, right? No, no, no. God loves a cheerful giver. This word cheerful is the word for hilarious in Greek. It's the idea that you give and your heart is happy about giving. So, 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 let me give you an example. This is horrible. Here we go. So, somebody comes to you and says, hey, would you help me move? You just look at them and go, no. Because I don't want to. It's not saying that every time you do something, it will be pleasant. Jesus went to the cross, it said, it said, for the joy put before him. The cross was not enjoyable, but he knew the result. Here's the deal. If you really love people, and you really want to love people, you won't help them because they make you feel sad. You won't help them because they're giving you a guilt trip. You better help me. You'll help them because you love them. And so I look forward to the day that somebody in here will say, I was so glad to help my brother-in-law move. What? By the way, anybody here enjoy helping somebody move? We want to write your name down and keep it up here at the church. All right, good. All right. I got one. Your name will forever be on the wall and say, need help? Call this number right here. Anyway. Truth is, nobody goes, oh, please, let's move again. I, you know, if you do... Whatever medicine you're on, please share with the congregation. So, so here's the deal. So, so as you help people, here's what happens. You and I tend to do things out of guilt and compulsion, and then we become resentful. So what happens there? Well, then what happens is we get upset. And so then we've helped somebody, and then they don't do exactly what we want. And what do we say? Well, I don't really want to help you anyway. You ever had somebody do that to you? Then you're like, oh, what? So that happens at church, by the way. I, I, let me just give you an example, okay? Let's say somebody, we, we came to somebody and we said, hey, we really need you to help at the door. And for whatever reason, they're like, oh, that's because the pastor asked me. I have to. So then you're coming in the door at church and they're going, there's Bolton. There's Bolton. Whatever. I don't even like this church. I don't know why I go there. I'm not, I, didn't, I purposely did not get a breath mint and had onions today. <laughs> And then, and then, and then somebody comes to them and says, you know, the person who's kind of heading up greeting says, hey, hey, listen, could you, could you just, you know, I don't know, have a, have a minute. Could you, could you, could you maybe be a little nicer? Oh, I didn't want to do this anyway. I did it because the pastor wanted to. <laughs> Baby. Why? Because we did it out of the wrong motivation. By the way, that's not a real hard job. Just stop ready. Hey, how's it going? Good to see you. Thanks for coming. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, that's what I do bulletins. You're not supposed to do that. Actually, I have no idea. I don't pay any attention to what anybody's wearing, and mostly myself. So <laughs> some of you are like, yeah, we knew that, Pastor. You have no idea. In Deuteronomy 15 in the Old Testament, it basically says you're blessed if you don't give grudgingly. So it's the idea that you give and you're happy about it. Listen, never, ever give a dime to our church that you don't want to give. Ever. Don't ever go, I guess I will because the pastor made me feel bad. No, don't. Stop. Don't. You give because God loves you and you want to do what's right. And so you say, God, you bless me. I want to give back what you've given to me. We, we don't need your money. God doesn't need any of our money. He can take care of us. I once, I, I, can t I hate to tell this on TV. So 
I once got a check in the mail for $400,000 from somebody who didn't even go to church, yeah. the church I was at. God can do whatever he wants. You're meeting in a building today that none of you paid for. Mm -hmm. On property that none of us paid for. Somebody else paid for it, did all the work, put all the thing, and God in his sovereignty one day said, you know what? Those people need a building, you know what? And he put it on the hearts of the people that were here, and God worked all the details out. And one day, I got a call that said, hey, what do you think? We did nothing in God's grace, and so many people who went up of us to give. God takes care of people. And listen, I pray that he blesses everybody who ever gave a dime to make this possible here. But I also know that when I give, I don't give going, well, God needs my money today. No, he doesn't. But I give because I say, God, you've done so much for me. I give to you. Do not give out of sorrow or compulsion. Don't help out of sorrow or compulsion. But you know when I know revival's happening? When we are saying to people, I'm sorry, we don't need any more help with the babies right now. But when we have, you know, we'll put you on a waiting list. That's revival. That's when God's really working in the hearts of people. Number two, can I say no without feeling guilty or angry? Here's what it says. People with quick tempers cause trouble, but those who control their tempers stop a quarrel. Now, how many of you know an angry person? Raise your hand. Yes. I see those hands, right? How many of you are married to? No, don't raise that. Okay. So, <laughs> somebody raise their hand anyway. No? Okay. We'll get you some counseling. It's really okay. All right. So. But we all know people, and listen, some of you grew up in homes where your parents never enforced rules until they were angry. And so you never learned good boundaries. You learned not to make so-and-so angry. That's all you knew. And though now you struggle with, with either being a parent or being a person because you don't have good boundaries because all you learned was don't make them angry. My goal in life is don't be angry. It had nothing to do with you learning how to have boundaries. It had nothing to do with doing what you wanted to do or not wanted to do. It had to do with let's not make somebody angry. That is not love. It's a terrible motivation. But let me tell you what it looks like in a practical sense. Parents, by the way, parents don't just, I mean, have even rules. So they, they've done studies. Parents, it's not about you being strict or you being lenient. It's about you being consistent. Anger is not consistent. Everybody knows what it's like to walk on eggshells around an angry person. That's why it says here, people with quick tempers cause trouble. And when you think of somebody who has a quick temper, you don't go, what a joy. <laughs> it's such a privilege, right? You think, oh, God, they get mad about everything, right? So here's what it looks like in your house. You see the dishes in the sink. You see the dishes in the sink. You see the dishes in the sink. In the back of your head, you have a conversation with no one and everyone. And you think, I don't know why so-and-so can't do the dishes. I should give them a piece of my mind. I don't know why anybody's lazy. I'm the only one who does anything around here. You know, I'm the only one. And then you go in and you wash the dishes and you do angry dishwashing. <laughs> Passive aggressive. You're making enough noise the whole house. You're, right? One of our members came to me and said, you know, I do that, and I say, I guess nobody around here has thumbs. <laughs> A little passive aggressive, right? Why do we do that? Because we're angry. How do we keep from being angry? Ready? This is a bigger one. Don't wash the dishes. Oh, I can't do that. Okay, then wash them and don't be angry. <laughs> Eric, there's got to be more than that. Nope. <laughs> Get over yourself. It's dishes. It took you five minutes. Your anger is giving you a heart attack. It's going to take ten minutes off your life. I think you're messing up. <laughs> Throw all your plates away by paper once. It's really bad, okay? Whatever. Okay. So you notice resentment. You can do it without guilt or anger. Number three, can I, this is hard, can I allow others to say no? And this includes your children. I'm going to get there in a second. Listen to this. This is God. Okay, so God can do whatever he wants, right? So if God wanted you to listen today, he could show up and go, Eric's talking, quit thinking about food. But he mentioned the restaurant, God. No, now, right? Some of you would quit being ADD suddenly, right? Okay, so... And he doesn't do that. Listen to what it says in the Bible in Revelation. 
Here I am. I knock the door down. No. Here I am. This is God. It's talking about Jesus. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with that person and they with me. God allows us to say no. We need to allow others to say no, including our children. If you physically grab your children to get them to do stuff, you are destroying your children's boundaries. Some of you had your boundaries destroyed as children and you end up getting hurt by somebody else because you didn't realize you could say no to an adult. Teach your children to say no and yes on their own. Oh, but Eric, then they won't do what I want them to do. Oh, yes, they will. Oh, yes, they will. Let me tell you how. I don't get angry at my children. Well, okay, I get angry at my children, but I try not to get angry. So let me tell you in a perfect week what this looks like in my house, okay? Let me give you the old story first, and then I'll give you a new story, okay? So the old story is the McDonald's story. If you haven't heard me tell it yet, I'm going to tell it again. So I'm on the way home from church. I'm going to get McFood because I'm McTired. So I pull into the big place with my McCar, and as I pull up, I say to the children, we don't have a lot of money, we are getting Happy Meals. As I pull in behind the line, my children begin, I don't want that. This is years ago, because now my kids say, oh, I don't want that. <laughs> but years ago, they'd say, I don't want that, I want a Big Mac, I want that, I want this, I want that. I said, well, no, no, no. Listen, Dad is buying Happy Meals. That is all we're having is Happy Meals today. Ah, no, 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 no. no problem. And I pull out of the line. And I hear from the back seat, Woo-hoo. Uh, Woo! There's great sorrow in Gildar. <laughs> Princess Bride? Kids are I pull out, we go home. They have peanut butter and sadness sandwiches. Right? The next time I pull into McDonald's, I say, kids, we're having Happy Meals. Father, <laughs> do I have a Sprite with my Happy Meal? <laughs> would you guys like Sprite or Coke? What, what would you like to dip your nuggets in? <laughs> Father, may we have barbecue sauce? <laughs> now, you think that's the only thing. Listen, I am a cheapskate because I don't want to spend $50 on drinks when I go to eat. So we go to Steak and Shake, which is four bucks. So it means for a family of five, it's 20 bucks plus a $5 tip. By the way, if you don't tip 20%, you tell them you go to a different church. <laughs> Just tip 20%. Okay, all right. So if you don't, and if you don't have money to tip, don't go out to eat. I'm, I'm, uh, anyway, I serve tables and all. You're preaching now. All right, so. <laughs> Once a year, I give a $50 tip to a server. Once a year. Because when I waited tables, I remember I had no money. And somebody one day gave me $50. And I was the best service I ever. And I was horrible that day. I was horrible. And they gave me $50 anyway. And I was like, whoa. That has nothing to do with the sermon. But there you go. All right. So, so I tell the kids. I tell the kids, you're not getting drinks. We are not paying four bucks or three bucks for you to have three sips of soda. We're having water with lemon. Now, if on the way there, my kids go, oh, but I want a cup. You what? You want a what? Because I don't go to eat somewhere where my children order coats. Father, <laughs> may I have lemon with my water? Which you may. <laughs> to this day, if you go with me to eat, you go with me to eat, you sit down with the pastor, and I got my kids around the table, and we're all there at the, at the fancy steak and shake with the greasy floors. <laughs> Don't go in the bathroom, don't go in the bathroom, don't go in the bathroom. Okay. Kids, we're going to do the four dollar meals, four dollar meals. Father, may I have a soda? Well, let me see, this is a special day, yes, you can have a soda today. Thank you, Father, you're so good. Or, Father, if I pay for it, may I have a soda? Of course, you pay for it, you can have a soda. What do I tell my kids? They can say yes, they can say no. If they say no, guess what? We leave the restaurant. Yeah. They say, no, we pull out of McDonald's drive-thru. Now, you're thinking, well, how does that apply to my life? I have teenagers, they don't care. <laughs> Let's say you have chores for your teenagers. Maybe they're supposed to take the garbage out. And they decide they're not taking the garbage out. And maybe they just forget. Well, that's okay, we allow forgetting. It's not a problem at all. In our house, it's not a problem. 
You have forgotten that I told you four times to take the garbage out. I'm not yelling. I'm not screaming. I just simply go in the living room, and there's a little box that says internet, and I just pull the plug. <laughs> and then you say, nay, nay, Eric, my children have free cell phone service online. They could just get on. Oh, no, no, nay, nay. I don't know what your service is, but I have AT&T, and I can go in and say, no more data. Click. <laughs> Father, my phone's broken. No, it's not. Until the garbage goes out, there is no internet. Father, after I take the garbage out, what else can I do to make you happy that the internet will find an on switch? There's no yelling, there's no screaming. What did I do? I just created a boundary. You're allowed to say no to me, but when you say no to me, the benefits go away, and I have lots of benefits. The technology is so wonderful. For me, so much. Now, please don't be extreme and instantly go from, you didn't take the garbage out, give me your phone, give me your thing, give me the, you know, come on, don't be crazy. Little bitty steps create boundaries, not hammers. Allow them to say no, but allow them to have consequences of their choices, no matter how little they are, so they will learn to have boundaries for themselves, not force things. You don't just say, I'm the boss. How many of you, have you ever had a boss that said, I'm the boss, and that's the reason you need to do something? Isn't that a wonderful motivation? Just like, yes, boss. Sorry, Jude, you had a boss like that. Number four! <laughs> Can I say yes without fear? So we talked about resentment, guilt, anger, and allow others to say no. Can I say yes without fear? This is a great verse. It's talking about God. There is no fear. That's talking about bondage, slavery, in love, but per perfect love drives out fear. In the Greek, this is the idea of pushing fear outside and closing the door. I love that. Perfect love drives out all fear. Why? Because fear has to do with punishment. How many of you are motivated to obey God out of punishment? The one who fears is not made perfect in love. If you really want to enjoy God's love, you have to begin to understand that God's not in heaven with a baseball bat waiting for you to mess up. Yes, there's consequences for your behavior, but you're choosing that. He doesn't even make you choose salvation. He says, I've given you a free gift. Do you want it? I don't want it. Okay. You don't have to do what I want you to do. Do whatever you want. It's okay. But there's consequences for your no. Even with God. Some of you grew up with parents who took off or didn't take care of you or somebody in your life who when you did something wrong, they just walked out of your life or they gave you the silent treatment and so you felt like you rejected and now you go through life and the only reason you do things for people because you're worried about them rejecting you. In your marriage, you keep a little list because you think, oh, you did this, and I did this, and you did this, and I did this, and that makes you good. And you think you're in competition because you grew up with somebody in competition with you. That's not love. I love all of my children. They still choose their yeses and noes. But I love each of them equally. God absolutely loves you. Some of you are walking into curses, and that's not God's fault. Some of you are walking into blessings, and God's blessing you. And by the way, in life sometimes, even when you do what's right, you suffer and you struggle. But no matter what, God will always be with you, and perfect love drives out fear. And then number five, do I treasure close relationships? Let me tell you what this looks like. You're on the way somewhere, and you're late, and you begin yelling at the people in the car because you're worried about people that you hardly know. Don't choose people who are not your treasure over your treasure. When you're in a hurry and you're leaving late and you're in the back of your mind, you're thinking, but these people will think blah, blah, blah. You're more worried about those people who, by the way, are probably late too than you are about the person in the car or the person in your family or the person that you should love. Do you treasure your treasures or are you more worried about what other people will think? When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. This is how the love chapter ends up when he says, this is what love is. And then he says, I've learned how to really love. Have you learned how to really love? You can't unless you let people say yes and you let people say no. Now let me give you some quick things about words. And we're going to fly through these, which is going to drive our poor people crazy. Here's some word danger signs. You talk nonstop to hide from intimacy. How many of you know somebody who talks nonstop? How many of you know somebody like that? If you didn't raise your hand, it's you. you just dominate conversations in order to control others. Gossip to make themselves look better or others worse. Make sarcastic remarks. <laughs> make direct threats. 
flatter or seduce instead of authentic praise. So here's the bonus sermon. Number one, how, do, how, do, how are my words boundaries? How are my word boundaries? Number one, I'm honest with my words. The Bible says speaking the truth in love. You need both. Every once in a while somebody says, well, I'm a truth teller. Yeah, but you're a jerk. <laughs> speaking the truth in love. Well, I don't like to tell anybody think, well, okay, well, then you're not balanced either. If you're a mature believer, you speak the truth and you speak it in love. And then it says, who do I need to be honest with this week? Number two, you can look at the other verses later. Number two, am I kind with my words? In your home this morning, were you kind with your words? This week, were you kind with your words? In your anger, do not sin. Why? Because you're going to get angry. You don't have to say everything that's up here. Believe it or not, I know you think I do, but I don't. I know it seems like I do, but you should see the things that roll through here sometimes. I mean, there are times the squirrels go, no, no, you really can't say that one. I'm like, oh yeah, better not. And guess what? You don't have to either. If you wouldn't say it to your boss, you probably shouldn't say it to your spouse. In your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry and don't give the devil Foothold. Do I need to ask forgiveness for my words? Some of you on the way home may need to say, that was me today. Number three, do my words build up or tear down? Let me tell you how big of a deal this is. Let me read it. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. A few years ago, I went to a church, and somebody asked me from that church. They said, oh, how's your church doing? I said, oh, man, it's so great. And I told them a couple things that had happened, very specific things that nobody knew but me. I went back to that church a week later. The secretary, as I opened the door, stood up and said, I have heard so many good things about your church. And then she went to repeat exactly what I had said. I thought, I could have lied and said all of those things. I'm going to start making stuff up. <laughs> but I also realized this. If they had said, how's your church doing? I said, oh, those people. I'll tell you, if we only, and you fill in the blank. When I come in the door, I tell you what she would have done. Hey, I saw it. And in the back of her mind, going, "Oh, he works at a church." Blah, blah, blah. You ready? Your friends don't go here to church. When you leave here, what you say is what truth is true. Now, I love it when you say I'm a nut, <laughs> and I love it when you tell people I'm crazy. And one of the best things I love is when you say, "You got to hear him. You never know what he's going to say." But if you leave and go, I tell you, then guess what your friends are going to think? It doesn't have to be true when you say it. And so are you building people up? But Eric, you don't understand. They are blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. But do you see the potential in them? Are you only talking to them about what you see wrong, or are you talking to them about the potential in them? So who do you need to build up this week? So are we learning good boundaries? How are you doing? God has given you a good yes and a good no. Some of you who said no for years need to learn how to say yes, understanding that in the middle of that you can say yes and still have boundaries. It'll help you enjoy life, be a better parent, boss, employee, student, and my favorite, a better church member. No matter how good you are at boundaries, you and I can learn better boundaries. But here's the number one thing. If you don't know Jesus Christ, and you don't have a relationship with him. We don't do a formal invitation where people come forward and the song plays. You feel sorrowful, so you come forward. We do an invitation. You come up after the service and you say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ. Two people this week have said, Eric, I want to be baptized. So you can come to me after the service and say, Eric, would you pray for me? Or Eric, I want to know what it means to be a Christian. If you're here today and the truth is that I did this message, you realize, oh, i got to apologize to so-and-so. Apologize to them. Ask God to give you the strength to do it. But I'd love to talk to you after the service. We're going to have time of giving you just a moment. Once again, you give what God's put on your heart today. It's not what anybody makes you give. You give because you love God and you know he loves you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, thank you for this series on boundaries. I pray, Lord, that as we learn a good yes and a good no, that we could find joy in serving. That we wouldn't serve you out of guilt or out of sorrow, but, Father, we would serve you hilariously because we know all you've done for us and we're so happy just to bless others with your presence. And, Father, I know that as we do this, you will fill us with your strength. Lord, some folks here are really dealing with this boundary issue right now. It's very difficult in their home or very difficult with their family. I pray that even in the middle of that, you would give them joy as they do difficult things because of the joy set before them. They see the results. 
Lord, help us to walk in you. I pray as a church we'd have good boundaries to love people that come in the door and love them unconditionally. Lord, letting them know we care about you, and so this is the boundary. Father, thank you that you loved us, that we opened the door. And Father, you will come in, but we have to open the door. I pray for that one who hasn't opened the door today, that today they would open their door, their door of their heart to you. Father, now bless our offerings as things go around the world. I pray you bless each one of them. In Jesus' name, amen. Every time of offering now, give what God's put on your heart. Thanks for being here today.